Um, seems like a long time since I was standing behind this podium, actually. Uh, and so, again, uh, it's great to see everybody in person. Uh, before we actually get started, I have the mandatory announcements. And the announcements basically are that we're broadcasting, hopefully, live via live stream and YouTube. Uh, I'm not really going to take any questions from this. This is more informational. Uh, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. Uh, we're very proud of it. And uh, we have three conferences that are upcoming. Uh, Heart of a Woman, uh, February 11th. The Adult Congenital Heart Disease Symposium, February 18th. And the Houston Heart for Your Summit on February 4th. So my name is Alan Lumsden. I have the uh, privilege of being the chair of CV Surgery and the medical director for the Heart and Vascular Center. And what we've been doing on an annual basis is really talking about the state of the Heart and Vascular Center. Uh, and talking really about some of the remarkable activities that are going on here. Uh, I stand here really representing a whole bunch of people, particularly the, my co-chairs and Dr. Zogby uh, and Dr. Cook. And uh, this is really a collective information uh, from the, these different departments. So, let me move on. We have a remarkable history. I'm not going to go through all the slides and all the firsts. Uh, I was talking to the first medical director of the Heart and Vascular Center was Al Raisner. And I was talking to John Abukalel before we got started. And he, he's worked with Dr. Reisner from the beginning. And he tells me that he's been working at Methodist for 48 years, John. So congratulations. Thank you and Dr. Reisner really for your contribution. Really remarkable. So as I said, I'm not really going to go through this whole thing. I want to talk about what defines us. Our name is Methodist Debakey Heart and Vascular Center. And so we're really defined by two names, both of which have remarkable significance. Um, I've often said that Methodist is a hundred-year-old startup. We celebrated our hundredth anniversary several years ago, but as an academic organization, you know, less of a startup than when I gave this presentation perhaps five years ago. But nevertheless, in academic terms, we're still really a startup organization, uh, competing and competing very successfully with many of the big academic organizations that have been around for a hundred years. We changed our identity, really, at that time. And despite the fact that we completely changed the DNA of this organization after the divorce from Baylor, we're now an honor roll hospital, not just in and out and back in. We've been there consistently now, basically, for several years. We have consistently been the top-ranked hospital in Texas. The platform that we often take for granted is the remarkable financial stability of this organization. Most of the people here, but we have an audience really across the system, and a lot of the focus of my talk, at least for the first you know, half of this, is really going to be about the system. But their financial stability is what allows us to do the things that we really kind of enjoy doing. Um, I've been in institutions where uh, there was not financial stability. And I can tell you that the education programs, first thing out the window, followed by research. And so we certainly don't take for granted, you know, the solid foundation that exists in this organization that's been created by the administration. We also basically went through a remarkable pivot uh, during the pandemic. And I think we're all very proud, really, of what happened. But it does show us something. It shows you what can be done, can be done very rapidly when your back's against the wall and you basically got to make those changes. And I think what we should think about is how we maintain some of that agility, you know, and responding to problems as we move forward. And secondly, of course, we've got the, uh, the Bakey name, probably the single most iconic name in cardiovascular disease. So that's really what defines us and, and creates basically our moral compass. There's a picture there really of the original Mathis Hospital, the original Mayo Clinic. And I think we aspire really to emulate what's been done at the Mayo Clinic. I think most of us believe with the right focus, the right effort, recruiting the right people, that we can actually get to that level. And that's really where we actually want to go. So th that's who we are, Mathis, DeBakey, Heart and Vascular Center. When I gave this talk about 10 years ago, that existed here. It didn't exist anywhere else. But now that's really changed. And we've pivoted, again, to a system approach. And every time we build a program, we're not just thinking about what exists down here, we're thinking about how this influences how we work collectively across the system. You know, at one time, several years ago, there were more open heart cases done in the medical center than there were collectively across the system. It's not like that anymore, okay? We, a few years ago, it was equal, and now we actually see collectively there are more cases often being done as a system collective. And so we see enormous potential power in that. But to do this, you know, the two parts of this is the structure of the physical plant, and then the secondly is the physicians. So we're going to talk really a little bit more about the membership format that we've created. 
this report previously was Department of Cardiology, Department of CV Surgery. Now we're really going to talk about how we're working together across the system and how we've built some of these system initiatives, trying to standardize quality across the system and the scorecard that we've created in order to be able to do that. And so I made this word up. I don't know if it actually exists, but we're talking about systemness and how we do this, you know, not just here. What can we learn basically from programs that have been developed at West and the Woodlands, for example, and how do we basically maintain this idea that you come to Methodist for a certain level of quality, regardless of which institution that you're going to be. So number one is the physical plan. The physical plan continues to expand. One of the exciting things that have gone on, of course, is basically the fact that we're going to open a new hospital in Cyprus. Uh, that will be a full-service hospital from a cardiovascular standpoint. There will have cath labs, they'll have operating rooms, they'll have hybrid operating rooms. The medical buildings will open a little bit ahead of schedule in 2024, and the hospital itself will open in 2025. And we really look forward to that. Now, if you look at that hospital, you might think that looks like the Woodlands, and it looks a little bit like West. And again, this is part, basically, of the branding of Methodist Hospital, is that we create superb infrastructure that allows us really to go ahead and practice, you know, within that. And so there's similarities in terms of the hybrid rooms, how you walk those corridors, basically, and how these things are being constructed. And that's a very important part, basically, of what's going on. So number one, we've kind of, we're building the physical plant and the system and a hospital system. And secondly, we've started creating a system of positions. Now, if you look at those two columns, the number of physicians who, are, who have privileges at Methodist Hospital uh, are enormous. And you see 310 cardiologists really across the system. 145, eight, you know, are members of this. So we've got some work to do in trying to persuade some of our colleagues who are independent and in private practice to actually think about joining and becoming members of the Methodist Debakey Heart and Vascular Center. And you can kind of look down through this list. And so of all the people who, who, are, who can practice at Methodist, only 44% are employed, and some 56% basically remain as independent physicians. And we would like to encourage some of our independent physicians to become members of the Methodist Debakey Heart and Vascular Center. And the reason for that is we think there's value in that brand. By creating these membership criteria, we can create certain uh, benchmarks and standards and purchasing, and I'll go on through basically this a little bit. And you can see the breakdown of the components. There's a, uh, the cardiology is the biggest component, CV surgery, critical care, anesthesia, and we also made an opportunity for folks in research really to participate in this. So what are we trying to do by creating physician membership uh, and encouraging people to increase the sense of belonging to the heart and vascular center? And so what are we trying to do? Debakey Heart and Vascular Center is the clinical and academic network for the employed and independent physicians across the Houston Methodist system. The Methodist Debakey Heart and Vascular Center is the single most visible center of excellence nationally. You know, when you, when you pull physicians across the country, the programs that they know most about, because of those two names probably and the legacy here, you know, is the Methodist Debakey Heart and Vascular Center. And we're also kind of leading in terms of trying to create this physician network. And so by creating alignment and structure, creating a governance system, you know, we hope basically to standardize quality, standardize purchasing really across the system so that we maintain, you know, our economic advantages and we maintain basically the ability to create those kind of unbelievable hospital resources uh, that we've demonstrated to you. And so the vision and strategies for this are that we aspire to be a nationally recognized leader, you know, in the delivery of quality cardiovascular care with a commitment to research, teaching, innovation, and above all, clinical care. Again, in this organization, we always talk about the three-legged stool of academia. Well, there's one really big leg here, and that is the ability to deliver high-quality clinical care. And I think we all recognize that's something we are very proud of. If we get that wrong, then the research and education doesn't really matter. So that's the pivot, really, of what we need to do. Okay, so we built a governance structure that we think reflects the system. Um, it's not really about running this from downtown. It's trying to get everybody across the system to engage and feel like they're really part, basically, of this. And so we built an executive committee. You can see what the responsibilities are. We have a, a leadership council. Again, the responsibilities are defined. And then we broke it out into a variety of position committees who can, or people who can actually participate um, in these various different product uh, value analysis, quality performance, research, and, and education components of this. I'm not going to go through this. It's just to, to demonstrate to you the fact that there is representation really across the system. 
And there's been pretty active participation from the leaders at the various different uh, centers that we've actually involved these folks in. And as part of the system administrative structure, you know, this is really what's been created. And so the CEO executive leader that represents the heart and vascular center and represents the neurological service, you know, is Debbie Sukin. And Debbie was, a, when I moved here, Debbie was the VP for the heart and vascular center. And so she's got a lot of experience really in managing heart and vascular services and has done an amazing job really in the growth that has occurred up at the woodland. The system administrator uh, that we have basically sitting down the front here is Emily Cow. Um, and she's got the thankless job basically of driving between all of these different hospitals, not just getting to know the people down here, but trying to get to know all these physicians really across the system. And, and Emily has done a, a great job from that standpoint. If we look basically at uh, the change that has occurred here, and that is that Kathy Williamson, she has now taken over really a couple of weeks ago as the vice president for the Heart and Vascular Center at Mathis. And that's a pretty pivotal role in liaison with, with, with Emily. And also basically with Tammy Plum, who's the administrator in our departments. And again, we have basically, uh, Dr. Zogby and I have responsibilities basically across the system. John Cook, Cardiovascular Sciences. Then we're going to talk a little bit more about CV anesthesia and critical care. So we look at some of the accomplishments for the system, you know, in 2022. We launched the System Heart and Vascular Center Quality Dashboard, and I'll show you that. Some of you think that's a regressive move, but it's something that we actually have to do. We implemented the System uh, TAVR uh, M&M Conference. Again, these are not easy things to create. You've got to get buy-in from seven different hospitals uh, to be able to do this. We opened the, um, the Willowbrook TAVI site. We achieved ACC uh, accreditation basically for the TAVI program. We'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, we have basically implemented a cost saving strategy by trying to standardize basically across the system. There's a lot more work to be done than this. And we created and grew the Debakey membership by some 12%. And we have implemented this new governance model. So that's basically in the rear view mirror. If you look basically at the system quality dashboard, and this is really uh, the, the, the dashboard that has been created. For the first time, really, we, we can, at one glance, look at how we are performing system-wide. We try to make this relatively simple so we can use the, the, the typical, basically, yellow, blue, red, and see how we're actually doing. And then it gives us a chance to compare, you know, horizontally across the system what the performance is. This can also be broken down, basically, into numerical format. Um, and we can break it down according to the DRG so we see what procedures are being done you know, fairly easily basically across the system. So this is something that's going to be available to everybody who's really part basically of this membership group and we'll start basically posting that. As part of this, we also started trying to look at which programs are where. I mean, this may sound pretty obvious, but we didn't really know. And so this is kind of what Emily has been working on is making this list, as you can see along the left side, of which programs exist at which institutions. Um, and where are the gaps that we need to try and fill in and which are the ones basically th that are uniquely positioned potentially down here, for example. And so you can, again, you can see this incredible dashboard that we've got here. And we've started racking up basically some awards. The one I really want to highlight particularly is what we basically got from uh, being certified basically across the system for Tower. And uh, the, the Tower Group, really under Steve Little's leadership, has really done a remarkable job in, in pulling this together. A little resistance up front, but I think we've done this the right way. And the outcomes of the tower groups across the systems have all been superb. And really thanks to Steve for spearheading that. Thanks to Mike and Neil for taking on the training. Often that involves going out to the peripheral hospitals to support them. But I think that the outcomes that you're seeing across the system really reflect the fact that there's been a remarkable job in terms, basically, of segueing this amount. And, and Dr. Gall is really one of the ones who's, who's uh, increasingly taken leadership, basically, a role in this. In 2023, these are the system strategic initiatives that we're going to roll out. Uh, we, we, will, we have started building a clinical practices repository. Now, now what do I mean by that? Again, there are a lot of work that's done in each individual hospital. For example, spinal drain protocol may exist here. Uh, maybe no need for it elsewhere, but there are lots of other protocols, basically, in post-op cab care, basically, or post-op groin management. And a lot of work goes on in the individual hospitals. They exist somewhere, often in somebody's drawer, you know, and haven't really made it to a central uh, repository for all of these practices. And again, one of the things we're trying to do is centralize this. So if the administration is watching from across the system, please, as we build these protocols, send a copy to Emily. She's building this so that this will now be available across the system. 
It may not be completely appropriate for your institution, but you can modify that, but you don't need, necessarily need to start from scratch. And this is another tool by which we think we can start standardizing some of the activities really that are occurring really across the system. And you know, we're going to continue to identify cost savings from CV value-based care. We want to continue to recruit uh, into the physician network and restructure the non-invasive and invasive cardiology council and constitute our quality performance committee. So any volunteers who want to be involved in that basically let us know. I don't need to dwell on this, but we, we tend to classify these programs into areas where there's strategic growth that we need to invest in. Um, those of you with red boxes, we'd be happy to see that. Uh, those where we just think we, we, we got to have it. And, and other complementary, perhaps specialty areas that we may need specialty clinics across the system. And this is something we look at really on an annual basis. So that's what I want to say predominantly about the system. And I'm going to kind of pivot to really talk about the different components that exist down here. Um, we are largely and are heavily dependent, at least in surgery, and an increase in the amount of the cath lab on support from our anesthesia services. And an anesthesia basically is not at a residency program. They are now building a residency program under Dr. Stedman's leadership, working with Scott Lindbergh, basically, uh, who's an independent physician. And, you know, and increasingly, we, one of the things that we really need to know is what are the recruitment plans in these operating rooms and also in the uh, cath lab so that Dr. Stedman can actually recruit anesthesia alongside this. We know we've had problems in nursing availability in these interventional suites nursing availability in our ICUs, and anesthesia availability, although that seems basically have gotten a lot better. The person who's headed up in the CV anesthesia here really is Marty Giesecke, and Marty's actually going to retire. It's hard to imagine that somebody who looks this young and boyish is actually going to hang it up, you know. I guess I'm in kind of the wrong profession, both for the youthful look, basically, and also get to retire early. But uh, Marty, I just really want to say thank you very much for all your efforts. We're actually looking for uh, a new uh, chief of CV anesthesia to replace him. Now, anesthesia and critical care kind of, in our world, kind of think of basically roll up, basically, to some extent, you know, under Dr. Stedman and anesthesia. But sitting in the front row, of course, is Dr. Faisal Masood. And again, one of the things that's happened, you know, over the past, when was the systemization of critical care created a couple of years ago? And Dr. Masood really heads that up. So... On the one hand, he's a critical care specialist, but we think of him as our critical care specialist because his background really is in CV anesthesia. And, you know, this has made a dramatic difference in terms of the quality of outcomes that are occurring based out of our ICUs across the system. And if you look basically uh, in the mortality, we are amongst the lowest amongst the, the different cohorts, tremendous outcomes in our ICUs. The case mix index is amongst the highest. That means you got amongst the sickest patients. So best outcomes, sickest patients. Uh, kudos to uh, Dr. Masood. And I'm sure he would say to all the other intensivists across the system. Length of stay, median percentile. Uh, length of stay is a problem basically for everything that we do at the moment. And it's one of the areas of focus that we're actively working on. Um, under his guidance, they've also started ramping up their critical care research and hopefully continuous and, and, and education uh, Faisal, although there's some increasing challenges in how we're going to fund education really as we go forward. And you'll hear a little bit more about that basically in the next few weeks. So what's next from them? Again, he's, he's going to partner increasingly. The Debakey Cardiovascular Education Team has been the support group basically for all the education products that we create and increasingly out of the critical care uh, group uh, under Faisal's uh, tutelage. Um, these are the Faculty Development Educational website and also expansion of the Critical Care Fellowship is important. I put this in and basically want to step back a little bit. I think that, uh, you know, some think this is an advance, some think it's an abomination. Um, but on the other hand, it's here to stay, okay? And, you know, I've been talking to Dr. Zogby about this. I think it's time for us to move from passive resistance. Uh, this is never going to work. We just need to buy more intensives. There are not more intensives to be brought in here. To active participation in fixing this problem. You know, I think that when the word virtual you're going to hear more and more and more. How many people here have actually been over to the monitoring center over in Skirlock? It's worthwhile going over there to look at it. It's a very, very impressive setup. And the power, okay, is that the data analytics, you can go back and trend back over a couple of days. And so the whole concept of this is all of this data is streaming over there from the ICU. Um, Right now, the streaming, what we ultimately need to be able to do is go back and look at this. And the whole concept is to build these predictive analytics that will allow us, with big data, 
uh, to be able to understand what is going on in advance with these patients. And one of the things that I really want to propose here is this concept of remote cardiovascular care. Again, when I talk about remote nursing to a surgeon, I got to peel them off the floor or off the wall because, you know, the answer is pay the nurses more and we'll be able to staff it. That's not going to be the solution. Uh, we got to think very differently about how we're going to do this. So what is remote nursing? Remote nursing basically is that when a patient rolls into a bed in an ICU, they get equivalent of a nurse in H&P. That is moved over to that monitoring center. And when you go up and talk to the nurses who are up there, they're basically admitting the patient, talking to the patient. The nurses there love it. They may be at a little different stage in their career. They want it to be a little bit more controlled. And the concept is to optimize the amount of bedside time that the bedside nurse has. And when you think about it from that standpoint, all of a sudden this becomes a lot more logical. There's virtual monitoring basically for falls. We have remote case support. Dr. Grammy can monitor what's going on in my patient's head when he's basically out of the country, for example. Uh, the remote monitoring and census. The remote cockpit is something, a Siemens product that allows super techs, for example, down here to be able to optimize MR and uh, CT scans. So the reason I've listed this and remote monitoring appella, again, you either see this as a great idea or the beginning of the end. We have monitors, cameras now in our operating rooms that track everything that's going on in the OR. So it's installed in the orthopedic OR and our operating room. And the whole idea is automatic notification uh, to Dr. Atkins that his patient's in the room, automatic notification that the drapes are up there, as well as being able to tell what stage of the operation these things are actually at. And so virtual and remote sensing is here to stay. Mm. We have kind of looked at this a little askance, but I think as a concept of remote cardiovascular care that we can build into the heart and vascular center, I think it's very important. And so, as I say, the COVID example showed how rapidly we can engage. A lot of this has been built out of the innovation center, you know, that uh, Roberta basically heads up. And a lot of it is that we're very far down this line. And what I would say to all the division chiefs is, as you kind of build a strategy for the future, this is something we really need to build in. I'd really like to see us have a conference here on virtual cardiovascular care, because we are leading in this in the United States. What it needs is physician engagement to, to tune this up in the way that, that we want it. Active participation, not passive resistance is where we're at. Now I'm going to pin a pivot over and, into the EP world. And they, they have been remarkably successful in growing these programs and in building probably one of the most robust research operations that we actually have under uh, Dr. Valder Abano. And so I can't go through all of this. I do want to ha highlight basically Dr. Mathuria um, because he is a guy who works out at West. And every time I go up to Mighty into the hybrid room, there he is, hard at work, using me, see the Siemens imaging equipment, using the MR, using the, the hybrid room, and, and, and working on an NIH-funded study. Essentially, basically working out in the West, he's figured out how to apply for an NIH grant and to work downtown. And I think that's a model as we talk about systemness that he's kind of the predicate example of somebody who can do that. So really hats off to him. Uh, to be able to pull off a busy clinical practice uh, while utilizing the resources. I always say to people that play, places like Mighty, the imaging that we have, doesn't belong here. It belongs to the system. And when you change that mindset to think of everything that's going on downtown, I can potentially use, and how do I use that basically and enhance really what, I, what I'm doing. So again, the EP group basically has a very extensive portfolio from basic science basically all the way through to, again, Top of the line, multi-center clinical trial of vein of, uh, vein of Marshall ethanol ablation are uh, remarkably put together by uh, Dr. Uh, Valder Abano. I was telling him, I can't really figure out whether he's the smartest guy or the dumbest guy to take on doing something like that because that is an unbelievable responsibility to become the PI of a multi-center clinical trial and kudos to the fact that he pulled it off. And this is just an example of some of the funding that's coming in through them. Uh, the basic science lab, these are kind of, I'm not going to go through individually these projects, but just to give you some idea of the, the scope and the scale, basically, of the operation, basically, they're actually running. I do want to give, while we're talking about the EP, a little bit of credit here, basically, to, to doc, Dr. Wolf. He created an operation called the Wolf Mini Maze. Um, he has almost single-handedly kind of built a, pr a remarkable program here. And you can see the, the growth that has occurred in this. And this is an example of direct-to-patient marketing. 
This is really done through a website, and it's done basically through our YouTube channel. And he's basically pulling in patients from essentially... I don't know if there are a few gaps there, Randy, that you've got to fill in in terms of the state, but I think we'd actually get there. And just I think it gives an example, basically, of the comprehensive nature of the antiarrhythmic care, basically, that's offered here. Pivot again, basically, onto our CV imaging faculty, who essentially... Our, this flagship operation for uh, cardiovascular imaging across the United States and, frankly, across the world. I see Dr. Quinone has basically just kind of came in. He, he gets a lot of the credit with Dr. Winters for establishing that. And Dr. Zogbe basically has taken that even to uh, yet another level. And you can see the imaging faculty they essentially are working across the spectrum basically, of cardiovascular care. The volumes, you know, that you are reflected up here are just truly massive. And... Essentially, this reflects how busy the service is, you know, and how busy this hospital is. And so if the cardiovascular imaging volumes are going down, we're all in trouble. You see the hospital, this helps drive basically the, the type of imaging that's occurring. And there are new programs such as the PET program. You can see in 2018, nothing. And now they're up to 2022, nearly 2,856 studies. That is truly amazing. And the same thing basically happens, you can see, with the cardiac MR volume. And so... When you look in 2021, that's the last complete year, you're talking about nearly 180,000 studies, basically, that, that are going through, through that group. And likewise, basically, this is now extending really across the system. And again, my appeal is, as we build this across the system, how do we utilize scarce resources that may only exist in one particular area? So, for example, you know, the, the, the MR techs down here are remarkably capable. The CT techs are remarkably capable. How can we think about how we leverage this into supporting the system and continuing to grow the system while minimizing the cost base at the same time? 130 peer-reviewed publications, 2021. That's pretty good, Bob. We got, I got compliments to the entire group who are actually, who are actually doing this. Imaging and, and the structural heart program essentially go hand in hand. It's one of the reasons that Steve Little really heads, heads this thing up. Um, this whole idea of interventional echo and interventional imaging. I will say I'm not really interested in how an MR scan works or CT scan. I'm interested in how we use that and apply it basically to our patients. And I think that being able to take these studies, move them basically out of a diagnostic lab into a cath lab in an operating room is really the transformation that has taken place at the moment. And having to create a new specialty, you know, I think Steve has taken over basically as the president of the American Society of Echo Cardiography is how do you fund them? And how basically do you train people uh, for interventional echocardiography as we move forward? And so the structural heart program has really been uh, also the flagship, at least on from the intervention side, and have done a truly remarkable job. I think Dr. Reardon, how many New England Journal publications at four or five? Nine. Okay, well, you know, always good to underestimate rather than overestimate. And so uh, I would say when you've got that many New England Journal publications, you know, this is for our marketing department, you can't buy, you know, that kind of PR as we try to improve our reputational score, you know, across, across the country. And these are just a few of the first that have occurred here. And, you know, we all know that this is the beginning of a wedge. Certainly can't go through all of these different trials that are coming down the line. But mitral is up, tricuspid is up. Essentially, no part basically is going to be sacrosanct. And we are on the forefront of that. And I think it's very important, you know, that we participate in these trials. We continue to have a little bit of a problem with how much the device costs and whether we're going to participate in those trials. We go back and learn what happened with Tavar. We were not involved in the first Tavar trial that occurred here. We only got in the second trial. And had we not got in that trial, this would be a very different place today from what it is as at the moment. And we got in that trial. The Tavar group knocked it out of the park in terms of the recruitment. That led to them being invited to be the national PIs on sequential trials. That's what drives the New England Journal publications. That then drives Mighty because when it gets approved, you know, we are the training site, for example, for Corval. Uh, and that continues to bring people down here at somebody else's expense, traffic them through the organization, and show them the facilities. It's not easy to explain to people what has been done here at Methodist Hospital. Once they've been here, once they've met you, and once they've walked through the organization and seen what we have, then they know who we are. And that's really how we influence our reputational score as you going forward. Okay, pivot to heart failure. Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin's tough. 
He sent me every day. Well, get me a transplant surgeon. Get me another transplant surgeon. And so she joined us from, but that's kind of good. You know, talk to Yvette. That's kind of the way to, to get at me, keep on me. So she joined us from the University of Minnesota, and she's the director of advanced heart failure, transplantation, mechanical circulatory support. I need to get a reporter. I get that. Uh, we're working on this. Today. And so it's fantastic, really, to have you here. I mean, I've seen her present at, you know, at donor conferences, and you're going to have a remarkable impact, and I think that we're all delighted to have you here. But you've got a formidable task. You've got a good start, basically, because this high-quality program and get with, the gold line, the get with the Guidelines came to us this year, and we got a gold plus, so kudos to all the heart for your docs who are here. Again, we always look at these programs, research, education, and, and clinical care. And they've got a heart failure conference coming up, as I say, this month. They've also an interesting one that's directly uh, directed to, towards patients. Now, uh, that based on adult congenital heart disease. System-wide, you can see how these subspecialty group spaces are starting to expand across the system and how we are networked, basically, all the way as far as the uh, league city. Uh, and I guess that's clear like basically, and up to, uh, to Conway at uh, the Woodlands. It's a big group, and this group basically has been complemented very nicely uh, by independent physicians, you know, some that came or joined over here uh, from Texas Heart, some of you are working you know, in the community. Uh, but this has been a very nice contribution to this Heart for Your program. We just closed the year with 58 heart transplants. Given the fact that we've been struggling for, the, for surgeons to do this, that is a remarkable achievement. Um, and, you know, we think there's enormous capacity actually to grow this uh, going forward. And, you know, the heart failure team, the surgery team, uh, I really take my hat off to them. They've joined at the HEP uh, to service this. And so when Dr. McGilvery left, uh, it's been a real challenge to actually keep this going. And they've done this year a remarkable job. The entire team, thank you really for your contribution. And again, this is just examples of ACO positions that we've kind of added really across the system who contribute really to the, to the growth here. If you look basically at where we are in terms of the national ranks, just in terms of volume, I think we come in at number seven for heart, number three for liver. Congratulations to the liver group. Um, there's been lots of discussions with Dr. Gobriel about how we can potentially grow this and grow it. We think that we can. Nobody's interested in growing it at the sake of quality. The quality outcomes from these, these, this group is absolutely fantastic. And we added this year basically the first basically of our um, uh, DCD heart transplant. So it's a little Frankenstein-ish kind of when you look at this. But this is another way in which you're going to be able to grow the volume is be able to keep the heart, perfuse the heart, kind of like the lungs, treat them, uh, special area set aside for that, and make a decision about when and if we're going to transplant that. And so the other person I really want to give a lot of kudos to is Du Yuren. I mean, he has been, you know, in the yeoman's work in terms of going out, basically, and harvesting, you know, nonstop, never quite knows when he's going to get that call. And then that's Du you can see featured in there, looking at that heart beating, beating in a box there. And the research side, one of the more exciting things, and I think, I think the patent's been applied for, I'm not sure it's been issued yet, is this idea, basically, of a vaccine against, basically, heart failure. And Keith Yoker, Guillermo, and Arvin, basically, have been actively involved in that. Huey Lynn, basically, has headed up our adult congenital heart disease program. Um, he, basically, is going to be with us for a while. Uh, we're glad that he's staying with us. And, you know, the, not only, basically, has he recruited some amazing people like Valeria, I believe we're also trying to get another interventionist. And um, Dr. Martin, of course, is also basically adult congenital heart certified. So that group has expanded. I know. We've got to find you a surgeon. We're working on, we're working on the surgeon, surgical part of it. Those people, as you know, not easy to find. And this is just a few examples of the, of the programs that were initiated. One of the ones we're excited about, of course, is the balloon pulmonary angioplastic. We started the CTEF program several years ago. Mahesh Ramchandani, basically, he's headed up the surgical part of it. Really needs balloon pulmonary angioplasty to complement that. And Huey, basically, took that on. So far, doing a great job. Valeria, you can see our cardioobstetric program. This really helps our mortality, basically, in the operating room. When we deliver a baby, we're trying to figure out if we can offset that and our mortality. We get one goes in, two comes out. You know, probably can work a deal there somewhere. Um, used to introduce Dr. Nasser as one of the newer members of the group. That's not the case anymore. He's, he's getting to be one of the more seasoned members of the group, and it's transformed prevention and wellness. For a long time, there's a discussion. Do we really want a prevention and wellness program here? Um, you know, no interventions. How's it going to make money? Well, this guy basically has figured out how to recruit, build, and looking at how to create these things and make sustainability. Uh, he got this Arthur Agassiz Prize and Award and that really, Arthur Agerson is the guy who created the, the calcium scoring machine in the coronary arteries. 
and he really considers Karam AC one of his protégés. So congratulations, Karam. Not only in that, but really all these other thing concepts as part of Zero Concept they've created, uh, building a very robust cardiovascular program. Um, I think, well, Eric's over here. We need to get Karam AC involved AC in the management of the peripheral vascular patients because it's a, an area that we continue to we, uh, fall behind AC a little bit and Karam can help us. This idea that some people have risk factors and don't get cardiovascular disease. How can you use them really to try and figure out, you know, how we can learn from those patients? What are the protective factors that are going on here? And this is how Karam really has put it together. Not just basically the goals, but the sustainability and how we bring in grants, which he's done par excellence, uh, and how we create the return of investment for some of the upfront investments that have been created. He has a uh, CATS uh, award, and the CATS, uh, the CATS family are a very important message to Methodist. Uh, if you walk on the research institute, you'll see these pictures really that are up there. What that allows us to do is hire somebody that we buy part of the time so they can focus it on research. The two that we have in the Horton Vascular Center at the moment are uh, Dr. Nasser and Dr. Roy. Dr. Nasser, I've talked about Dr. Roy. You can see he is focused on vascular imaging and device development in the lower extremity. And hopefully in the near future, there'll be other uh, CAT scholars in the Heart and Vascular Center that we can actually uh, talk to you about. But this is a remarkable way in which Methodist Hospital has raised money to support, you know, clinician scientists in that, in that respect. I'm going to pivot now really to talk about research. You can't really talk about research without talking about John Cook. Obviously, he heads up the entire basic science program here. Um, but I also trying to change the way we do clinical research. Now, we created this emulator from Stanford, which is from where he came, these research affinity groups. Doesn't matter whether you're a surgeon or whether you're a cardiologist or a basic researcher or an anesthesiologist, put them in pods that really kind of work together. And each of those pods have a leader, uh, and that leader is responsible for managing that clinical trial uh, portfolio and to some extent basically their, their profit and loss statement. And some years, some of these make money. Some years, some of them don't make money. Um, and it's interesting that as the hot topics change, the ones that are real profitable basically change. Um, the deal that we have with the Research Institute is that we manage this as a heart and vascular center. Uh, sometimes that causes a little bit of a problem because if one group loses money, then Dr. Zogby, Dr. Cook, and I have to take money from that group to subsidize the other. The Hearts and Vascular Center has never, as a in total, lost money. And at the end of the year, basically, the surplus is kind of used, and then we figure out, you know, usually most of it goes back to the people that have generated that revenue. Uh, but sometimes, basically, supporting database development or something like that that, has, uh, that benefits the entire system. So that's kind of the way it works. To the left of the basic science operations, Dr. Cook has been particularly interested in RNA therapeutics. Many of that kind of came into the fore, uh, basically, during covid these are the kind of grants basically that were submitted last year and the amount of money that was awarded. And if you look, and this is what John did, was to look at the, the Fart and Vascular Center in total. We'd, we put out about 400 publications that year. That is easily the most in the entire organization. And that is thanks to you and hopefully increasingly to the people in the community who kind of buy into this component of the mission. A lot of people who are involved in basic science, that's John with his customary red shirt and waistcoat in the middle there. Um, and he produced this annual report where some of this data comes from for the, for the, the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences. I'm not going to go through all of these different research labs. There's way too many for me to do this. These slides will all be available to you. So for anybody who wants to uh, use some of these slides, talk about the Heart and Vascular Center, we want to make this genetically available. Uh, Emily is going to have a copy of them because it can save you a lot of time. If you're out there talking about the Heart and Vascular Center, you are more than welcome to use uh, these slides anytime you like. And so these are just some of the other research labs. I put it up here really for, because often we don't know, and that's another area we can probably do a better job in is, is, is bringing people together, making them aware of what some of your colleagues are doing over in the Research Institute. And if there's an opportunity for clinicians watching this to link up with some of the basic scientists, then they will be uh, very, basically appreciative of this. And as I said, John has been on the forefront of RNA nanotherapeutics. This is him talking about it at the annual Costas meeting. If you remember that the Mr. And Mrs. Costas, basically, were part of the Heart and Vascular Center Council. They were patients here, and they funded the development of the Costas Center uh, for cardiovascular nanomedicine. 
And so this is sort of what supports several projects and also this meeting which occurs every year and is completely unique. As we talk really about the system, you know, a lot of these clinical trials have existed here. And just think about the fact if we can recruit across the system. And so what has really been done now under Pauline Todd, and remember Pauline Todd used to be in the Heart and Vascular Center, so she's Heart and Vascular Center friendly, aren't you Pauline? And so her charge is to build the research infrastructure across the system. And now basically we have the opportunity. We don't have dedicated heart and vascular center coordinators out there, but we have research coordinators. And if there's a cardiovascular trial, they can participate in it. And so we've now started, you know, in running some of these trials basically across the system. Jaguar is a randomized trial around stink grafts. Save BC is a brand new concept and, and uh, surgically sewing in valves. And I actually went out and helped one of our partners do this out at Sugarland. But the concept is that we are now starting to look and see how we actually run these clinical trials really across the system. And I think that's a very important development. And Pauline Todd is, is, the, is the key person, you know, in being able to do this. We moved up to number 13 in U.S. News and World Report. These are kind of the, the marketing slides, basically, which we actually have. You know, we kind of bubble around 13 to 15. You know, what's going on, what we need to be able to move us up higher is predominantly focused on quality. Once you get into the upper echelons of these big heart and vascular centers, the difference is really around quality. And for, for that, it's not that we have bad quality, but we don't have the best quality. And that's where we need to go. And so one of the things that Dr. Zogby has particularly been working on is this concept of HDAI. Essentially what HDAI is, is a Health Data Analytics Institute. What it does is it emulates uh, the U.S. News and World Report, and it lets us start to look in a much more granular way about the heart and vascular center outcomes. And there are certain areas that we can focus on about where quality lacks. And so the, the issue for that, so for example, if we look at our in-hospital mortality rate for open heart surgery, then it's absolutely superb. Mm -hmm. If you look at our week two, we see like, and we drop down from being fifth or sixth in the nation down to about number um, 30. And so the problem is not occurring here. The problem is how we now project our care out into the uh, community after the patient is discharged. Being involved remotely, figure out how we do this, multiple contacts when the patient is being discharged. And we're gonna, we have a couple of areas that we really wanna focus on doing this. If you look at the commercial preference for Houston Matha, so we are the top blue line. Now, what, what does this mean? It means if you have insurance and they go to and say, where would you like to go? They'll say Matha. So that doesn't mean they can go here because there's contracts that limit this. But that's the starting point by showing how we are progressively increasing. I was on a call yesterday with Woodlands, and Woodlands are just obliterating their competition, you know, in that area in terms of commercial preference. And I want to quote Debbie here because she said, we were last to market five years ago and first in preference. And that preference is a function of all of these, this composite of all these things I've been talking about. The structure of the building, the quality base of the leadership, the quality of the nursing care, uh, the quality of people who answer the phones when they, when they call your office. It's that team approach. And I noticed yesterday that we were kind of ranked by one of the groups at number 33 in terms of employee satisfaction, you know, in the United States. Now we're competing with all manufacturing, all industry from that. And I think this is a reflection basically of who we are as an organization. And if you look at some of our competition, would you rather be the blue line or the red line or the green line? I won't even say basically who they actually are, but we are moving in the right direction. And this is a reflection basically of what we are bringing to it. Because we created the system membership, remember we used to have Sugarland Marketing, Methodist Downtown Marketing, West Marketing. Frankly, we competed with one another. By bringing everybody together as a system, the agreement was that we will now market Methodist to make your heart and vascular center since we have a unified brand system-wide. It allows us to have more resources and uniformity in the messaging that is essentially going out there. And this is really how this was rolled out you know, we basically look at the areas that we want to focus on. Do we have capacity? Uh, what are the areas we want to grow? Basically, what are the potentially the lucrative areas? And those are the areas that we focus on. And this is still to be determined really for uh, system marketing for 2023. 
Our marketing department has also been charged with improving our reputational score. And that's a big leap, you know, from where we were in marketing to where we think that we need to be. People like you, and then you can see that this is, it's featuring unique programs, unique individuals, and that's increasingly what, we, what we're doing. Very robust digital marketing campaign to continually improve the national reputation. So if you're going to meetings and you have basically some major presentation you know, that you're given, please let our marketing department know or our PR department know so that they can basically, they can demonstrate that and, and make it available to the folks really that wrote that. And so you can see how this national reputation campaign, it was highlighted the work of cardiologists and CV surgeons. You can see some of the examples there of how we basically targeted these to these meetings in a variety of different ways we've actually done this. And this has led to huge amount of exposure for us actually over the past couple of years. Again, COVID certainly helped that and our involvement in COVID and heart disease. Uh, but nearly or an audience, estimated audience of 2 billion with more than a thousand media placement. Thank you to the marketing department basically for support over this. Some of the select headlines, here's Linda, uh, basically talking about unique aspects. So they have a very successful uh, Debakey CV Live program where we're talking about unique aspects of women in surgery. Uh, and that's where, you know, very well uh, looked and it was picked up actually by uh, Innovation Map here. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see again that DCD donor race here is also featured. So lots of exciting things, but it is important that we communicate it, either communicate it to Dr. Zogby and myself or communicate it direct basically to the department. Our educational programs probably is the best in class, you know, in the United States. And there are some significant challenges coming down the line in terms of continuing to fund that. Now, you'll hear more about that basically over the next few months. But we don't want to see this go backwards. We want to see this continue to go forward. It is one of the most distinctive things that we do. Every resident or fellow that we interview know a lot about us. They'll often sit down and say, hey, Dr. Zogby, it's nice to see you. I've heard you, you know, give a presentation. I feel like, feel like I know you before we actually get there. And the major program that we run, this is this cardiovascular fellows book camp. Uh, this year, we did it only basically with vascular and cardiology. Next year, we hope to be back up full scale uh, with cardiac surgery, CV anesthesia, uh, and cardiology. We, again, want to do this because we think it reflects the way that we function. We all work together. There's something special about being, uh, bringing these different groups. And when you go up to Mighty, and there are 120, 130 fellows kind of all running around, Mighty can handle that. And that's what's unique about that uh, component of the organization. And that's what's highly distinctive, really, for us. The YouTube channel, we're on a lot of the different uh, social media. That YouTube channel is probably the, uh, next, the only one I've seen that's bigger than this is the ACC YouTube channel. I've looked at a lot of them, but we're over 90,000 subscribers. For those of you who are not YouTube aficionados, when you get asked if you'd like to subscribe, you usually say no, because I don't want to be bothered by something like that. You got 90,000 people who've agreed to be told every time we post something up there. And so this will hit probably 100,000, you know, later on this year. And that is about 0.81% of all YouTube channels. And there's some pretty, pretty gnarly looking YouTube channels out there that we're competing with. You know, 0.81% of all YouTube channels have that. It is the front vehicle by which we are influencing people across the country. I travel the world, doesn't matter which country I'm in, they're watching our YouTube channel. And I think it's a major offering. This is free. There are no ads in front of our YouTube channels, because we don't get any money out of that. Well, no money means no funding. And so that, that's another story for another day that we're going to have to talk about. But we think this is a major contribution to understanding cardiovascular care for patients, for industry, and for physicians basically across the country. And Dr. Quinones really has been involved in the pivot of the Debakey CV uh, journal, really from being predominantly uh, on um, paper, you can still get it on paper, but increasingly online. And that allows us to be a lot more flexible and, then, and increasingly content, be a lot more flexible. And again, I would appeal to the fact that this is something we need to think more and more about in terms of, you know, short, small, small group publications, uh, interesting cases, videos. And I think that Dr. Q and I would agree that one of the things we've not done a good job of is linking the various different components of Debakey CV education and the journal together. The journal is an amazing platform that's been created. And thank you, really. Uh, thanks, Dr. Winters, for his, his, his vision about this. And thank you for Dr. Q for really taking it on. This is the portfolio that you run. And one of the things I think is important for the message for me to get out is, by and large, you're not getting compensated for doing this, okay? We turn up on Saturdays. A lot of these are Saturdays. 
You turn up on a Saturday, you teach it Saturday, Sunday, you're away from your family, and you do it basically for the joy of education. And that is, you know, an area that I think we don't appreciate how much time our faculty put into it. dreaming this up, designing them, delivering basically the, the lectures and the hands-on training, and raising basically the funding to do this. And so this is a huge portfolio. I don't think everything is actually on there. Uh, and thank you really for your contribution. I'm starting to close this out now and talk about the growth. These bars are from the Cardiology Fellowship. Remarkable growth. Remember, we didn't have any fellowships or residency when this split from Baylor card. Uh, it took a few years before we kind of got up and running. And now we really have a full complement of all of these programs. And you can see what the projected growth is. Nearly 41 uh, fellows based in cardiology. Uh, I want to thank Ross Rowe, really, for getting the CT program basically up and running. We had to build that from scratch. Eric Peden heads up the vascular fellowship. We have both a residency program and a fellowship. It's one of the bigger ones in the country. We have non-accredited fellowship. I also want to thank uh, Gerald and Boris, actually, for creating a cardiovascular PA training program. That's a very unique program and one basically supported with philanthropy, and we want to continue to grow that because it's all about building the farm team. So, you know, we, want, we always want to bring in people from outside because it's important that we get that outside influence. But at the end of the day, we're predominantly going to build these programs on bringing in the best quality residents we can and keeping the cream of the crop. That's kind of the name of the game here. And that's what we're headed for. What I've really talked really about Steve, uh, Dr. Alan Olaf, is going to be the president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. Great kudos. Again, can't buy this kind of uh, uh, information. The foundation has supported, and I think it's going to increasingly have to support a lot of these activities. And we've been very successful, you know, over the past few years in trying to uh, bring in money. Uh, the, the bigger year, we may say, why did we drop off? That was one de a donation of $8 million that we got that year. Typically, we're bringing in basically about $8 million we see, uh, on a year. And what that translates into, these are significant grips this year, but what that translates into is these are the endowed chairs that we've got and the length and breadth of the heart and vascular center. That's a big deal. Again, we had zero. We didn't even have a foundation uh, when uh, the split from Baylor actually occurred. So... I can't say enough about our partners in the foundation. Uh, they've really, they do a tremendous job in, in working with us. And what this allows us to do is provide some discretionary funding uh, to each of these individuals that can be used for their particular projects, which is predominantly around research and education. And we got a few that we still got to make appointments into. So in my last slide, I'm going to talk about We've talked about what we've done. What I want to talk about is, is where we are going, particularly around education. We, to make education, as I say, we need to continuously evolve this. We want to be thought of as having unique ability in education. Now, this is a project we started on during COVID. How do we take this experience? We've got this, we got the journal, we got this gigantic library of lectures and cases. Now, how do we take that issue out, you know, of, here and beyond. And that, uh, I want to thank Stuart Core, really, he's been working this week. He kind of plagiarized Metaverse and created Mightyverse. Inside the Mightyverse, which you basically experience by putting on um, a headset, you know, in virtual reality, allows us to actually deliver a lot of this content. And I'll give you an example of what this is going to look like. You can pull up all the different videos. You can click on it. Um, if QELN has got a uh, particularly complex adult congenital problem, we can segment out the heart using the imaging group, we can pull that in, and these can be physicians from around the world who are actually handling this and looking at it and interacting with one another in front of a large auditorium. So we want to get you guys involved in this. This is actually built. Uh, it's been announced about we need people who are going to beta test this to tell us really what some of these problems actually are. So it's 9 o'clock, and I want to thank you all. Sorry we got started a little bit late. Um, this is a reflection of what you've done, not basically what we have done. And it's uh, thank you for being here. And again, it's a privilege for us to be able to uh, work with you. Thank you.